Hey everybody, Rachel Ray here. In every class for our very first cooking camp together, we're gonna cook together, not just us, but a lot of my friends. You guys are gonna learn so many great techniques. You're gonna have so much fun. And at the end, you get to eat and share with all the people you love. And you know what I love? Everything we're doing together is gonna benefit the Boys and Girls Club of America and a brand new scholarship project. So we're doing well for others while we're making great food and doing well for ourselves and the people that we love. Thank you to all of our sponsors for making this possible. Game on, let's turn up the heat. Hello everyone, welcome to Rachel Ray's Yummo Cooking Camp. When we pick our tug of war teams, this chef is definitely my number one pick. Campers, open your hearts and welcome the chef of love, Chef Gernard Wells. Hey. How are you, Chef? I am good. I'm feeling good. I'm happy to be here on the camp. You know how long it's been, for, how hard it's been to break out the house. So finally, I get to break out and cook it up with you guys. That's what it's all about. Well, I'm glad that we are one of your first stops when you get out of the house. I know we're all kind of cooped up, but one of the things we've been learning over the past nine days, and we're going to do it again today, is how to cook and complete some incredible recipes. And today is going to be no exception. So we are thrilled to have you. We're going to be talking to you. We're going to be asking you questions. But most importantly, we're going to be uh, learning some mad skills from you. So listen, before we get started, as everybody's just kind of gathering all of their products, all of their ingredients, their mise en place, why don't you tell us what we're going to be doing today and kind of run us through what we should have in front of us right now before we get started. All right. So as, as you said earlier, Randy, we're going to have a walking good time. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, what we, so what we're going to make is a honey chicken garlic noodles. Very simple, amazing. This is a dish that I created several years ago. I launched a Asian restaurant in downtown Atlanta, and it was one of those staples because I, I've studied in so many different styles of cuisine, and I just want to create an infusion or a melting pot of dishes that will come together and marry each other. But it's very simple, so guys, don't worry at all. If you have all the ingredients and then some substitutes, we're going to get through this. So first, all you need is, need you some some fresh ginger. Now, if you don't have fresh ginger, you can use ginger paste, which is just good. I really just like fresh ginger. We have here sesame seed oil. We have hoisin. We have my lemon pepper ranch seasoning. We have here soy sauce. We have honey. We have garlic. And these are the components that you would use. These are the components that you would use to make the sauce that we're gonna saute our chicken in as well as our noodles. Now over here for our chicken, I have chicken thighs. I have some boneless, skinless chicken thighs. I think chicken thighs and the dark meat has the most flavor, so those are good to cook with. But if you don't like chicken thighs, you can use chicken breasts or any other kind of protein like shrimp, things like that go good with it as well. Then I here I have some olive oil cut with a little vegetable oil. And the reason I cut the olive oil with the vegetable oil is so my olive oil won't burn as fast. Then we have our amazing Barella pasta, the spaghetti. Now this is one of those key elements that really bring this noodle dish in, in on home. And you can't have a good dish without having some vegetables, guys. We got bird-sized steamables in here. Yep, you heard me. Broccoli, carrots, sugar snap peas, all of the amenities. Because look, even though I'm a chef, I still like shortcutting it sometimes with good, good vegetables that's already prepped, sliced, and diced for me. And then here, have a nice sprig of cilantro that we're going to actually use as a garnish on the end because I think garnishes really bring the flavor in good. So we got some great things for you. We're going to be cooking a great meal. We're going to make sure the house is smelling good. Mm -hmm. Everybody should be at your house right about now for lunch. <laughs> so campers, you should uh, take a look at what you just saw there on the screen. If there's something that maybe you forgot, go ahead and run over to your refrigerator or your pantry and grab it because we're going to get ready to go here and we've got a lot of steps to do and we're going to be learning some cool technique. So Chef Jernard, let's see if these campers can walk and talk at the same time. 
I sure look. I surely hope they can, Randy, because we're about to get it in, guys. We're about to get it in, and we're about to cook up some good stuff. All I'm waiting on is just for you guys to to get those rest, get all your ingredients together, as we call it in the chef world, your mise en place. Mise en place meaning having everything in order. And if you ever wonder why, when chefs go in the kitchen and how we can prepare and cook cook dishes real fast. The key is, is having everything already in place. See, a lot of times when we go in the kitchen, we, what we tend to do is what I call refrigerator and cabinet cookers. We know what we want, but we just pull them from the refrigerator, pull them from the cabinet as we go, and that takes longer. So first what we're gonna do, guys, we're gonna, we're gonna make our sauce up. That's the key, we're gonna make our sauce up. So I'm gonna start off here with my ginger, and we're gonna mince our ginger up. I got this cool bowl over here in the corner. Check this out. Rachel Ray calls this a garbage bowl. I just think it's so pretty, but I'm gonna use it for a garbage bowl. So I'm gonna put my, I'm gonna put my uh as I'm peeling my garlic, I'm gonna put my garlic lid, garlic trimmings in my garbage bowl. So just shave it here, just shave it all around here. Now, it's, Chef, uh, we got a question. Can you use a vegetable peeler when you're doing uh, a little peel on that ginger, or is a knife the preferred method? No, a vegetable peeler is very good, especially especially if you got some little ones that are in the kitchen with you, and you're not you you don't feel just so comfortable with them using a knife right off. Vegetable mm -hmm. peeler works amazingly. You know, even for 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 garlic for garlic for for carrots for for ginger, you name it. Now what I'm gonna do here is first I'm gonna do just a nice little slice. Then after I do the nice slice now, guys, this is what I always like doing. After I slice it, I take my knife, lay it like this. If you're not using a knife, you can easily get you a, a large spoon or so. But what you wanna do is just smash down, smash down on the ginger. We wanna smash it down and what that does is it breaks all that flavor up. If you can see here, that liquid coming out, that's what we want. So we want to break that flavor up there, guys. Get in there and get us a nice little mess. So there's nothing wrong with getting into it. There we go, there we go, look at this. Man, it's already smelling good, guys, and I ain't even started cooking. Or maybe it's just because of the simple fact I love the way ginger smells. So now I'm gonna add my ginger into the bottom of my bowl right here. So I got my ginger in. Now we got that minced garlic. Now my garlic I've already peeled. I've already peeled my garlic here guys. So they always think that's good. And you can just, just squeeze it to pull those leaves off. And what I do is I do, do your garlic the same way. I'll just do some nice slices on my garlic here. I'm gonna get some nice slices, slice it up. And then after we slice it, you take the knife and you go over it with the same flattening. And it's something about when using and blending garlic and ginger together. To me, they just, those flavors just marry so well together. But you'll see what I mean as you finish, eat, finish fixing your dish and you start tasting it. So we're gonna, Mince that up real good. Mince it up real good. Mince it up real good. And if you notice in your recipe, I think I may have, I may have called for two to three cloves of garlic in the recipe that you would have sung, but you saw I use four cloves. And what I like to do is, I like to just add a little bit of my garlic. So you can save a little bit of your garlic and just add it on top of the chicken. Even though we're going to mince it up, not like just letting that flavor just blend in good. So now that we added our ginger and our garlic together, now we're gonna add in our sesame seed. Our sesame oil. Now the thing is with sesame oil, sesame oil is sesame oil is very strong. So you really don't want to just use a little bit of sesame oil to it. Now we're gonna add in that honey. And the honey is really what brings in the flavor. And also a substitute, if you, if, you, if you don't have honey, you know, you can add brown sugar to it in the place of the honey, 
Or you also can add monk fruit, which is a natural sweetener, which is good. But I really love the essence of the honey. Now we're gonna add in the hoisin. The hoisin really gives it a nice, good, good Asian kick and feel. Now we're gonna add in here our soy sauce. And then we're gonna add in the lemon pepper ranch, which gives it a, a nice, good citrusy feel. And you have the pepper and then just that ranch flavor. It's one of the reasons I created the, the lemon pepper ranch because I saw how my kids really love lemon pepper and they love ranch. It's something, I don't know what it was about the two, but I said, you know, I need to create my own signature blend. And that's what I did. And, and they've been loving it ever since. So that's how your, your sauce should look. Chef, let me, ask you, let me ask you a quick yes. question uh, that came up. It looks like everybody ran out to get some of that, that spice that you just talked about, and some people couldn't catch it because it was sold out. What's a, great, <laughs> what's a great substitution for that spice blend if they weren't able to get it or in the future they need to get their hands on something? A great substitution for it is getting fresh lemon juice. And what you want to do is squeeze the lemon juice, then I always like taking my knife and getting the lemon zest off of the knife so you really get those, the essence of the lemon zest, lemon zest, lemon zest, and lemon juice. As y'all can see the word, I guess I'm getting tongue twisted with the word lemon. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then you add in some cracked black pepper, some kosher salt, and some fresh dill, and it'll give you the essence of what Chef Gennard's Lemon Pepper Ranch is all about. But of course, I always say, come back to me. It is back in stock. We ran out fast, guys. So thank you so much um, for even trying this season. For those that did get a chance to get it, I hope you love it. Also, you know, if we're cooking along with me, you either have just regular lemon pepper that you can use or follow, follow the example with the lemon juice, cracked black pepper, sea salt, and we're good to go. Great. So, Thanks for sharing that, Chef. Appreciate yeah, it. So, now that we have that, guys, what I'm going to do is, did you, did you guys already have your pasta noodles already pre boiled If you did, no worries, because one of the cool things, I really love the Barella pasta, so I already have some salted water boiling. Come around here. My camera guy's working with me today, so I already got, got me some salted water. And what I did with my water, I put in, put in two tablespoons of olive oil and a teaspoon of salt in it you can add more if you want but that works good to keep it from keep it from sticking and then we're just going to add that into our water here and what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to let this boil for roughly about nine minutes to get to a nice good al dente let me give it a good stir when you put it in there you want to want to let it just stir so if you didn't already have some pasta noodles, your, 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 your Barella spaghetti boiling, now is the time to go ahead and put that on. So now that we have that going, I'm going to fire up my wok. Because remember, guys, we're walking it up today. So I'm going to go ahead and get my wok nice and hot. And that's one of the things you want to do is you always want to allow your wok to get nice and hot before adding. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add my oil into it and you don't want to add a lot to it because we're going to go for a nice good shallow saute all right now that we have this warming up we're going to get on this chicken guys hey chef uh, ann was asking what's so special about using a wok what why why do you like that type of uh cooking utensil well one of the things about one of the things that i love about using a wok is a wok is a cylinder that heats completely all the way around. So it really captures the heat. It really allows for a great sear. And also you can cook so many different things in a wok. That's one of the, that's one of the most things, the, the, the biggest thing that I fell in love with a wok probably almost 20 years ago. And when I say, especially if you want to do fried rices, if you want to do stir fries, any kind of vegetables. It's just something about the way the wok and the oval shape of it, how it conducts the heat that really allows you to cook your food seamlessly. But don't worry, if you don't have a wok, a regular saute pan, I still get the job done. So, and if you want to get yourself a wok, head over to potsandpans.com because they've got a great selection. Jet Tila used one and Gennard is using one, but uh, if not, 
you got yourself a skillet. You can get to work. Exactly. Jan is a very good friend of mine. So yeah, me and Jet, what they say, birds of a feather flock together. So we both <laughs> walking this thing up. Now, if you notice what I did, guys, I changed chopping boards for my chicken. And of course, one of the things, because we're dealing with chicken, you, you always want to know, you want to be a healthy camper and a sanitized camper. So you always want to make sure you use a different chopping board anytime that you're using any kind of protein, especially chicken or anything, because we don't want anybody to get salmonella sick from cross-contamination. And also remember, once we finish cutting our chicken up, we're going to go and wash our hands too. Because campers, I want y'all to stay safe and healthy. All right. So now if you saw first what I did, and I'm going to do another one. First thing what I did was, I did a julienne strip on my chicken and then I turned it kind of clockwise and I did a dice. And so if you're wondering, okay, julienne strip, what is that? All right, <laughs> julienne strip is a long cut right here. Just a long cut right here. There we go. This is what you want right here. Then me, because I got a small chopping board, I can turn it. And now we go for a nice dice. What that also do, do for you guys, that helps you have a more uniform cut as well. So whenever you're cooking with someone, you know, even if you're cutting vegetables, you know, especially bell peppers, carrots, things, we will go for our julienne strip. Then we'll turn and we'll call it a slice and dice, slice and dice, slice and dice. We're all going to Rachel Ray's cooking camp, slice and dice, <laughs> slice and dice. <laughs> We're gonna pick up a we're gonna pick up a new jingle here, Shap. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, as you checking out the chicken, I stepped over here to wash my hands. Hey, listen, this yeah. might be a good time. Might be a good time for us to put up a quick poll, uh, asking campers what their favorite vegetable is to yes. add to to add to uh, their stir fry. So let's go ahead and put that up. So. What is your favorite vegetable to add to stir fry? Let's see what our responses look like. We got broccoli in there, we've got carrots, we've got snap peas, and we have all of the above. Let's give mm. it a few more seconds. Five, four, three, three, two, one. Let's lock it. Broccoli. Broccoli wins. Oh, wow. Wow. Broccoli comes in first, uh, second, all of the above, and third, carrots. Sorry, snap peas. Fourth place finish. But that's only because we need to work with you a little bit more to get to know you a little bit better. But thanks yeah, for that. Yeah, exactly. But thanks the snap peas, I think, are, are very good, especially if you add, like, some Thai chili sauce, something like that. I think snap peas, snap peas deserve, deserve a, a, a rematch. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what, what I'm going to do here is, now that I've, we're going to add in the sauce to our diced chicken here. And I always like saving a little of my sauce just on the tail end for when my noodles are ready. So we're going to make sure we blend that in real good here, guys. And this, this really makes for a great caramelization of flavor. Now let's take this over to our wok here. Hey, Chef, uh, David from Detroit wanted to know if the chicken does better if you were to marinate it overnight or for a few hours, or is, this, is it good to go just like this? Actually, it's good to go like this, but me, low and slow is always the way to go, David. The longer, the better. So if you marinate this, especially even if, even if you wasn't doing the whole dish, you want to do bigger pieces and you marinated this all night, overnight, the flavors will be outstanding. So that, I think that's a great question right there. Great. Thank you, David. Because I definitely encourage you guys, even after this, to just, you know, even when we're not on camera, just... Just duplicate this recipe. Duplicate this recipe and, and bring it on back in. Because it really makes for it makes for a perfect dinner. One of the things I really like this dish is, you know, when you dice it up, this also allows your chicken thighs to cook a lot faster as well. So we're just gonna work with this wok for a little bit, make sure that. Everything is cooking through. What temperature do you have your stove on right now, Chef? Actually, I have my stove on. I, I guess if we had to do a, in, um, an, an external temperature, it would be at roughly about 350. But okay. um, 
on the gas on the gas meter, I got it on six right next to high. Because okay. one of the things is when you're cooking, cooking with the wok, you want to make sure you got that, that wok nice and hot. And what are you looking for uh, as you're cooking? How do you know it's starting to get ready? What is it a color thing? It, yes, so yes. How, how does that work? Whenever your chicken, whenever your chicken is starting to get ready, what you want to look for is you want to look for your chicken to start turning completely white and a little more dense on the bounce back. And that's how you know that it's really, it's really done. We don't want any pink at all on our chicken. So this is definitely what you want. And as you'll see, you'll start to see pieces of the chicken as it's pieces of the chicken as it's starting to uh, to turn turn white. There, I I stopped stirring it for a moment so you guys can actually see how it's how it's starting to come to life here. And this is how it should be looking right now in your kitchen. And what and what I encourage any of you guys. Definitely, uh, I was, I've was i been seeing some cool pictures all week on, on Rachel Ray's page and her stories, the Yummo Camp. Definitely screenshot some pictures of your, of your cooking and, and tag Rachel Ray in it, tag me as Chef Gennard in it, so I can see how beautiful these dishes are coming together in your home. This is, this is, what, this is what you want right here. And as you'll see, you'll see it starting to, starting to fully come together. And that's one, also one of the keys by dicing, by dicing the chicken. This also allows, as I said earlier, it allows it to cook a whole lot faster. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely what we want. Right there. Hey, yeah. Chef, I, I know uh, campers love to see kind of the long shot. If we could ask the camera mm -hmm. person yeah. there to pull out a little bit, we like to see there you kind of, we, we want to make sure, we want to make sure you're still there, Gennard. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, because the moment I had the robotic arm oh, doing the stir. <laughs> hey, listen, we did we did get a question from Asher in Austin, wanting to know what other proteins would you recommend if you didn't want to use chicken in this dish? What could you use? If I didn't if I didn't use chicken in this dish, shrimp is shrimp is amazing with this oh, dish. Yeah. Also, flank steak is very good. Now with the okay. flank steak. I would, I would definitely home back to one of the questions that I received earlier, whereas with flank steak, you definitely don't want to let this marinate overnight so those flavors will really penetrate through. But flank steak works perfectly. Shrimp is, I think, probably my, outside of doing chicken thighs, I think shrimp is, is probably my number, would be my number two go-to on it. Now, well, what, about, here, uh, what about for vegetarian? You think we could sneak a tofu in there? Oh, tofu, tofu, tofu is good, but for vegetarians, what I really like putting in the place of mine is cremini and portobello mushrooms. Oh, Amazing. Yeah. You dice them up the same way that you dice the chicken up, and you pop those in there, saute them, the whole thing. And you know, mushrooms are really like sponges. Mushrooms are truly it absorb all of that flavor, so you really get, get that experience in everybody. Mm, I love that. love mushrooms. Yes, yes. There we go. How how are the campers going in? I, I want the campers to check in and tell us how they're going because I don't want to be moving too fast because I'm no, here I with think, you. I think you're yeah, I think you're you're working at a good uh, good rate there. We're getting some some nice questions. It looks like people are busy. They're stirring. They're waiting for that chicken to come to the right color and the right texture. Yes. Um, and yes. uh, we did. Emma, Emily asked a question of you, Chef. What's your what's your favorite spice to cook with? <laughs> you know, I think my my favorite spice to cook with is allspice. It's something about the allspice that really ties in, and I use my allspice in quite a few things. I use I use allspice. I make a I make an amazing gumbo, and I use allspice in it instead of the filet powder, which really brings it to life. Also. I do a lot of barbecue and things like that, and allspice I add into my barbecue rubs to give it a unique, distinct flavor. And a cool barbecue rub recipe, smoked paprika, allspice, brown sugar, kosher salt, cracked black pepper, onion powder, garlic powder, amazing. Wow, that's a recipe, right? That was a little bonus recipe we just got there. <laughs> 
That's what happens what? when you're cooking with the chef for love. <laughs> yeah, well, I got a question for you about that and some other questions for you, but I want to give a quick shout out. You know, we're partnered with the Boys and Girls Clubs of America as yeah. a partner. And we want to give a shout out today to the Aquasazne Boys and Girls Club and St. Regis Mohawk Tribe in New York who have served, get this chef, over 10,000 meals. Wow. So they're really, wow. uh, they're digging in and doing their part to make the world that, a better place. And that's that really something so wonderful. We give you a big, big applause there. Thanks guys for all your hard work. Yeah, now, that is so I, amazing. And, and you know, that's really what it's about, Randy. It's really about giving back, you know, because one of the things that I've learned in life, if you go through life with an open hand, whatever goes out always comes back. Mm, that's a good lesson. Now, talking about boys and girls clubs, one of the questions came up, and I know that there are going to be a lot of them. We know you have nine kids, right? Yeah. You got your own boys and you've got your own boys and girls club right there in the house. That's incredible. <laughs> Several people have asked us, what is the one dish that everybody can agree to in that household when they sit down at the dinner table? <laughs> Low country boil. Ooh. That's the that's the one dish. The Low Country Boil is it consists of shrimp, potatoes, corn, and crawfish. And Ooh. what I do is I make an amazing butter sauce. Now, so I think it's amazing. The kids tell me it's amazing, so I'm going off of what they say. <laughs> an, an amazing butter sauce that consists of minced garlic, butter, cayenne pepper, chili powder, my lemon pepper pepper seasoning and just blend those together and that's what I toss the, the shrimp, the crab, everything in there and we just have a feast. Literally, that's one of the dishes, bring that in close, I want them to see this while I'm sharing. See how this oh, yeah. is caramel, caramelizing together? Oh but yeah. Yes, yes guys, as I was saying, that low country ball is, a, is amazing. Now, what I've done is, even though you saw me drop my spaghetti, I already had some ready for you guys. Look how beautiful this is. Look how beautiful the Barilla pasta is. This is what you want right here. So what we do is we add that right on top of the chicken, guys. So we just add that right on the top. So your spaghetti should, your, your spaghetti should be ready um, for you to drain it. Or if you already made some, should be ready. And then what we want to do is we want to just get us a nice good toss there. Get us a nice toss, nice toss, get it all tossed and blended so that caramelization from that sauce really blends into it. And then what I do is because if you've been cooking your chicken at the same time that I've been cooking, that I've been cooking mine, um, it would have started to caramelize. And as you see, the pasta absorbed all of that sauce. There's no more sauce in the bottom of it. Me, I'm a sauce connoisseur, so I keep more <laughs> sauce on hand <laughs> just so I can add it on the back end here. And the wok is good and hot, so we just get that in. So we have that the extra, as I call it, that extra added lay, layer of flavor. It's all coming to life. This is. This is what you want. After this right here, Cap, you know, we, we, need, we need to make some s'mores, Randy. Oh yeah, who doesn't <laughs> love s'mores? I don't. Now that we've added that in, you know what time it is? Veggie time. <laughs> and the cool thing, what I, what I like about with, with the bird size steamables is the simple fact that they've, They've already taken all of the guesswork, everything out of it for me. So it cooks a lot faster, allow the, allow the sauce, the steam to really just, just bring this all in. So I want to get these just And for those of you who answered broccoli is your favorite, you're well taken care of with that. And it looks like uh, some of your other favorite vegetables in there as well, which is cool. Mm -hmm. We got carrots that's good for the eyes. <laughs> we got we got the broccoli. We got a little of sugar snap peas. We got we got the water chestnuts in here. Oh, those are great. That's great texture vegetable, right? It's uh, yes. often underused, but a really nice texture to throw into food. 
it, it, it is. And you, and you know, I think this is a great way if you if you're looking for unique ways to to incorporate multiple vegetables in your dish. This is definitely one of those ways that you can incorporate multiple vegetables in your dish. Also, it adds, if you see here, come, come, come in closer, my camera guy, camera. As you see here, how you have the color contrast that comes together. You have the green from the broccoli. You have the, you have the orange from the carrots. All of this balancing out with your noodles. And it, and it really just gives you more of an eye appeal feel and flavor. And, and those profiles of the nice, nice earth tones from the vegetables, all of that is what really makes this just come to life. Yeah, I gotta tell you, Chef, when I was getting ready for your recipe yesterday, I, uh, you know, people say uh, you, you never have enough hours in the day. Well, I found a couple of extra hours by calling on our friends at Ship to put together an order. And before I knew it this morning, they showed up on my doorstep. Everything I had ordered in perfect, perfect order. Um, and it was really just a great way to save a couple of hours of time. So it, it is, it is, you know, hey, ship, ship, ship been dropping stuff off at my door all weekend. And I definitely thank you for it, too. Ship kind of handy. Campers check into those guys. They have a really nice offer, very generous offer for people. Yes, yes, here we go. You see this? This is how it should be looking, guys. This is how we should be looking. Where your plate at? You want to go right into the center there. You want to go right into the center. I always say, whenever you're plating, you always want to plate from the center of the plate, guys. You always want to plate from the center in the center of your plate. That always really gives your plate a little more depth. Line to your plate here, and the key is campers making sure that you keep your plate yeah, clean, keep your plate clean there. Chef, we did get a question and when you added the vegetables, had you steamed them first or did you put them in frozen? Actually, I took, I took my vegetables, I always take my vegetables out of the freezer typically about an hour or so before cooking with them so they're fully mm -hmm. unthawed. And then I just add them straight in and I allow the heat and the steam from the noodles, from the chicken, from the oil, all of that to steam so that, because you know, the cool thing about with the birds, our vegetables in that bag there, in a steamable bag. So instead of going through the process of popping them in a microwave or so and steaming them, I allow the noodles and the chicken to, to steam them and bring them to life. Great, so uh, let's see, we got, uh, ah, going for a little green there, love that. Yes, yes, you always want your, your, your cilantro here, and what I did was, if you see, we're gonna go for a cool chef now, where I always bunch them together. So I bunch them together, then when I bunch them together, it allows for me to make a nice, cool menstrual. Now, I'm going to show you guys a cool technique before putting them on. If you, if you don't want the little ones to deal with knives or how knives or anything like that, these are cool kitchen hacks. I, you know, because as, as my children were growing up and they were, they were wanting to get in the kitchen with me, I was always looking for ways at first as I was starting to train them to use knives, how can I incorporate them in the kitchen without being worried about them touching the sharp mm -hmm. object? You got cilantro, you got parsley, you got forks, right? This is what you do right here. Check out this, check out this. You just run that fork through it and it breaks oh, all the nice leaves hack. up for you. Thanks, right? Break the leaves up for you. Yep. There we go. There we go. Right Something about there. putting that green on there at the end makes it feel like you're eating in a restaurant. I tell you, that's a great such a simple step, but it makes a huge impact. Yes, yes, yes. You know, you know, coming coming from owning five restaurants and working in so many as you know, young coming up in the culinary world, it really, you know, it just it just sticks with you. And by force, by force of habit, even when I'm cooking food at home, I find myself plating the whole family dishes up the same way. 
But here we go. Here we go. Wow. I, I wish I was right there with you. I know. I hey, look. I would have pulled I'm up a chair. I'm working on smell vision Randy. I'm working <laughs> on smell of vision Hey, do everybody else how they play it? I want to make sure I, I keep good manners. I, I, I don't want to just taste it just yet without <laughs> with leaving you all out. Now, another cool thing that you can do with it is if you want to add, speaking of heat, and you want to add a little spice to them, you can always add a little bit of crushed red pepper. That also gives it a nice edge as well. All right, let me let me get in here, Randy. Let me get in here. This is this this is smelling too good. Look at this. Mm. Check in here. How'd you do? Oh, <laughs> I think I did great. Oh man. <laughs> oh, something Look. tells me you did. This is so That's good, guys. A... I'm getting the essence of the garlic and the ginger coming through. That nice subtle sweetness from the honey just bringing it to life. And then the pasta is just phenomenal. Cooked to the perfect texture where you get that nice good bite off on it. And these vegetables, by cooking them this way in the skillet, it gives it that perfect bite. As you can see, and it's fully done. To look at the steam, I don't know if you can see the steam coming from it. Yeah. But oh, look, Randy, I don't know who the chef is, but I give him a perfect <laughs> thing. <laughs> well, I got to tell you something. That is a perfectly balanced meal as well. Super easy once you get your steps done. Judy yes. wants to know, and this is a good question. Judy wants to know, where did you get the nickname Chef of Love? <laughs> you know, it actually, the funny thing, it was given to me as a, as a child. When I opened Backstory. I started cooking when I was 10 years old. My father was a chef. Uh, my father passed away when I turned 16, and I had learned to cook, and I wanted a car going into my senior year in school. And so I came up with the bright idea. I wanted to open up a restaurant in my mother's kitchen so that I could buy a car without burdening my mother because I knew if I, if I, if I had a car that girls would pay attention to me and I could go out on dates and things like that. So I started cooking in the neighborhood to raise money to buy this car. And people would call to the home to place their orders in the neighborhood, a small area in Mississippi where I grew up, grew up. And they would always say, can we speak to that little, that little lovable chef? Chef got this, this, this selling food plates. And, and it started from there. Lo and behold, I made enough money to, to purchase my first restaurant, purchase my first car while cooking out of my mother's kitchen during the summer. But my thought process completely changed. Instead of buying a car and saying, oh, I want to continue to go out on dates, I bought a car, put on the side of it, now delivering, and started delivering food throughout the neighborhood. And it just kept growing and kept growing. And one day I made enough money to, to buy my first brick and mortar, pay my way through culinary arts school. And then I met the love of my life, Kena Wells, whom I've been married to now for 21 years, to be exact. And <laughs> that's, she came and she was like, hey, the only love chef you doing is for me, no one else. So <laughs> from there, I started writing. I said, okay, so how can I still share this with the world? Because other celebrities and entertainers, they would then hire me as uh, my, my repertoire grow. They would hire me to come in their houses, cook meals, and sneak out the back door and they would take all the credit for when they were doing first dates and things. So that that's kind of in a nutshell. And then I started writing love cookbooks. My first one that hit the bestsellers list was 88 Ways to a Heart, Cooking for Lovers. Oh, I love that. I love that. Uh, you know, Chloe's going to test your memory. She wants to know, what was the first dish you made back when you first started cooking? Do you remember? Yes. What your specialty was? Yes. My first dish that I made when I first started cooking was sweet and sour pork chops. And mm. growing up, and that was one of the things my, my grandfather had, had, a, had a farm and he had all kind of livestock. So I learned how to, to smoke, how to, to cure meats in a smokehouse with them and, and, and things like that. And that was one of those dishes that I had down packed and I created the sweet and sour recipe. I rubbed. I, I harvested at the time, harvested, harvested I, we would harvest fresh truffles. 
you know, you can go out and harvest them instead of paying that expensive price for them. You just got nowhere to go to, to, to sniff out truffles. So, hey, harvest them, smoke some pork chops that we cut down, and I made the sweet and sour pork chop dish that has always been with, been with me to this day. As a matter of fact, when I was on Food Network Star, because I was the runner-up on Food Network Star, when you had to create the dish of your life for Bobby Flay and Giada, that was the dish that I did. I did sweet and sour pork chops and a, uh, a smoked Gouda mac and cheese, and they Ooh. were completely blown away. Wow. Now, well, that brings us to a good question that Isabella had. She wants to know what was the most stressful challenge you faced in Food Network Star? <laughs> oh, all of them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I think, um, you know, they, they really throw some wild cards at you. It was one of the most amazing experiences that I've ever had. And to this day, I still give thanks to, to Food Network, Bobby and Giada for really mentoring me and, and pushing me beyond to go to that next level. But I think, um, oh man, if I had to think of probably my, my hardest challenge on there, it would have to be one where we, we had to do, I had to go to the, we had to go to this market in, in LA and, and, and decide, look at a theme and create these dishes. And that was probably one of my hardest ones. Um, and I don't know if it was necessarily before, because of the food or, or just, it was just one of those days for me because we have all those days. But of course I did redeem myself. It was, <laughs> and I redeemed myself in the next challenge, which was called the mashup challenge with Reverend Run on there as a, as a co-host. Oh, wow, yeah. Well, Reverend Run has been a good friend of the festival. We get to see him all the time. Harper's got a good question, may humble you a little bit. Uh, tell us about a kitchen fail that has happened to you during your career that always stuck with you? That's a good question, Harper. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, one of my, one of my big, biggest, I think, kitchen fails was, and, I, and probably a lot of people probably relate to it, is I think was, was doing Thanksgiving holiday. Thanksgiving holiday, I got this cool new grill, and, and you guys, a lot of people probably see these, the, the, the big old grills, that's the, the smokers and everything. So I get this cool grill, and I'm thinking to myself, hey, the guy who, when I purchased the grill, told me, hey, you got you to gotta learn it first and learn to test the temperatures and everything. And I had a whole bunch of people coming over for Thanksgiving dinner. And these turkeys that I had, I did a sweet tea brine smoke on where I marinate the turkeys for 24 hours in sweet tea, rosemary, basil, all these things where it's good. Put the turkey on the grill, close the grill down. I step in the house to start doing some other stuff. <laughs> I believe it probably wasn't even five minutes later because the grill built up pressure. And literally, by the time I stepped out, not realizing that the grill had reached almost an 800 degree temp. Ooh. When I lift the grill up, the turkey was literally, the turkey looked like this handle right here. So <laughs> here it is. I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to tell them? So, you know, the safest thing that you tell them whenever you burn food. It's black and turkey. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great save, an awesome save. I got to tell you. Hey, listen, we've been talking a lot about savory. Uh, wrapping up here, we have a couple more questions, but Neil brought up a good point. What is your favorite dessert? What's your go-to sweet, Chef? Oh, man. You know, I think my go-to sweet, it's a, it's a recipe that my mother's always made that is amazing. It's called Butterfinger Surprise Cake. And it's a, uh, it's like a vanilla, a vanilla and butter and rum cake, but then she has like crumbles of Butterfingers just broke up and baked into the cake. Cause my mother, by the way, is a, is a pastry chef or retired pastry chef, but it has all these uh, Butterfinger crumbles and this, this vanilla whipped cream that she make. Oh my goodness. Every time that I go back to Mississippi, that is always on my list. That and a pecan pie. Those are two mm. my, my two topics. I can eat that and go straight to sleep. And I won't even feel guilty about it. <laughs> my mom's from Nashville, Tennessee. She makes an incredible pecan pie. Yes. So I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> it's such a nice thing to have you here and talk about your passion. Uh, I, I'd love to leave the campers with 
a question or a thought for you that, that goes something like this. If you had to share what you think is one of the or a couple of the most important character traits for a young cook who is aspiring to get involved in the business, what has driven you, what character has built you and allowed you to reach the success that you've reached? And I know you've got a lot more going. So leave us with a, with a, with a thought on that and, and what, what we need to develop in order to be able to be more like you. The, the, the biggest thing that you want, you want to develop and instill in your heart is one word, is endurance. Endurance is one of those things that I adapted a long time ago because, you know, the race is, is not always given to the swift, but those that can endure to the end. And what we have to realize, what you have to realize, and I even myself had to realize, I'm not running a race against the next person or someone else. You're running your own race. So you put on your blinders and, and don't be concerned about what you see, people that are in the industry or whatever it is that you may be doing, because this applies to anything beyond just food or entertainment, just life in general. Don't focus on what you see others doing. Just focus on what you're doing and be the best at it. Be the best at who you are. Don't try to be the best at, some, at what someone else is or what someone's envisioning you to be. Be the best that you are, and regardless mm -hmm. of how many roadblocks are thrown at you, you know, how hard it gets. Because one of the things that's certain, you will get a lot of no's in life, but just know that no is only the next yes. So that's what you have to always keep in mind, regardless of how many times you hear no, regardless of how hard it looks or how bad the tables may look, why are you, why are you going through it, why are you trying to achieve or accomplish whatever it is, just know that you're in this race and keep your eyes on the finish line of what the goal is that you want and just keep going and, and, and know that in the end, it's going to all be worth it because you didn't do it for no one else. You did it for yourself. So uh -huh. endurance. I love that. I think it's a perfect message to end on, Chef. I got to tell you something. I know your philosophy is about food, about family, and about fun. Yes. It's also all encompassing. It's about love. It's about making the world a better place and yes. giving back. I got to tell you something. Your plate may be filled with pasta right there, but your heart is filled with love. And that's a great lesson that came through today. We appreciate Thank the time you. and the effort you gave. And I'll tell you something. If I'm in your neck of the woods, I'm inviting myself to that family dinner. I, I, I gotta, I gotta sit around that table and see what it's like to have a beautiful wife and nine children and everybody loving what they're eating. So it's I, like an all you can eat buffet at my house for, <laughs> for dinner. I love that, Chef. Thank you, thank you so much.